Good evening. 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 Is that work? All right. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Praise, praise the, the Lord. Lord. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to see each and every one of you here. And um, and it is so hard to believe. I, I can't believe it, that we're actually going to be starting the third session. We are halfway through the discipleship. Yes, so for your hands are saying, woo, thank you. Uh, it's so hard to believe that that we are gotten this halfway through already. And so, uh, but we have. And if you have finished section two, then just go ahead and write it in here. And uh, we want because we want to get your certificates. And again, a lot of times people say, "Well, I really, I really don't need a certificate." Yeah, you do. You've done a lot of hard work, and also it, it encourages other people. And so I, I want to encourage you: if you have done section two, or if you're going to get it done, uh, then go ahead and, and sign up for that. We're going to be giving out certificates. But I want to say what a great job you're doing. This is not easy. Uh, it's it's a challenging, and you have to put a lot of work in, a lot of effort, but it is worth it. And, and most of all, anytime you get into writing the scripture out, that's just good stuff. That's that's where the power is, and so that's that's incredible. I have a church in Ohio that's still using this, and it's interesting. Um, they're after me. They're saying, "When are you going to write the second one?" I said, <laughs> "Hold on, <laughs> got a lot of other things to write. Got two other things in the hopper, so got to get those taken care of." But uh, well, it's great to see each and every one of you. I, I want to remind you this Sunday, uh, first of all, we have church in the morning, so come in the morning. And then also we are having a special service on at 6 o'clock, and that is the installation for Pastor Donna. And so I want to strongly encourage you, come on out uh, and support that. She is doing a great, great job with our youth. We've got the greatest youth in the world and uh, done a wonderful job with worship. And we're going to have a special, super secret speaker named Chris. I, I mean, I wasn't supposed to tell you. And so uh, she's going to do a great job. We have faith in her. And so we're, we're looking forward to a really, really good time. So that's this Sunday at 6 o'clock, as, as hard as it is to believe. So, all right. Well, I want to open up with prayer. And then we're going to get rolling. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for this day and this time and this opportunity. And this privilege to come before you, you are our God. We ask that you're with our lesson. And Father, as all the lessons kind of come together, and, and we thank you because now we're going to kind of start getting a little deeper. We're going to dig, dig a little harder, and we're going to draw a little closer to you. And so I thank you for all the work that's been done. I thank you for the faithfulness of those who've done it. And I ask, Lord, that you'll be with them and bless them for their efforts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go ahead and talk about the books of the Bible all the way to Zephaniah. Man, that's a long way. All right, Genesis. It gets numbers. start out really, really good. Genesis, Exodus, Viticus, and then when we get down to Amos, Amos, uh, we get real quiet. You guys are doing great. Excellent. And again, I feel your pain. I am writing them out with you. I still get the, I, I just mix them up. I'm, I'm still going to put them in different orders. So I got to, I, I, I know them all, but I got to put them in the right order. So excellent. And then the verse last week, very powerful one, and it's one that's so applicable. 1 Corinthians 13. What does that say? Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Excellent. And I want to encourage you very strongly, that is a good test on do you love. In other words, if you truly say that you love someone, love is not just words. Love is not just lip service. 
If you truly love someone, then you can put your name in there. And that's sometimes in marriage counseling what I have people do is I'll have them actually put their name as uh, I am patient with Janine. Janine is kind to me and, and uh, things like that. So if you truly say you love someone, it can be seen. And 1 Corinthians 13 is a great, great love test. So if we want that. Well, we're going to be talking today about, uh, uh, for this next week, now, it, and what we basically break the discipleship down, it, it is basically the first uh, uh, session is kind of the basics, kind of the foundation. The second session talks about we're getting a little deeper, but the third and fourth session, now we're going to start getting real practical. Now we're just going to start kind of diving in. And um, this first week, though, we start out with service, and, and you're going to say, we've heard all this because we just ended up preaching in, in, in service. We just started preaching in service uh, last month. And so some of this is going to be really familiar for you, but we're going ahead and dig into it. So let's look at that. Service, day one. There have been those in our lives who significantly impacted us. And they inspired us. They encouraged us. They lifted us up. Now, when we think of how we've been benefited, it, it really is humbling. I mean, to think that someone would give of their time, of their efforts for us is, is incredible. And when we truly ponder how they've impacted us, it's broken down to one thing. We are impacted by people by how they have served us. We, it makes it, it's made a difference in our life for how we've been, been served. And, and the greatest act of service that's ever been taking place was accomplished by our great God. And so in our lifetime, we're not really going to be able to understand the complexity that makes up God. That's why I kind of get a kick out of sometimes when people say, I just can't figure God out. Exactly. <laughs> if you can't figure God out, J.B. Phillips wrote a book called Your God is Too Small. If you can figure God out, you, you don't have God. You have a figment of your imagination. And we're always going to be saying, wow, God is so big. God, we don't understand. He's so incredible. And so that's what we, we're never going to be able to figure God out. But we are going to be able to catch a little bit of glimpse of the intricacies of God by his actions. So we're going to be able to catch some of his attributes and some of his characteristics by what he does. And, and God loudly told us how much he loves us by what he did for us. And so Jesus, Jesus demonstrated the embodiment of this. And, and so we're going to kind of look at the service of Jesus. And when we talk, we're talking about Jesus, remember this is fully God. And at the very beginning, Jesus started serving at an early age. Luke 2.49, he, he said, remember he got separated from his family? And he said, why are you searching for me? He said, didn't you know I had to be in my father's what? House. House. And, and the way the Greeks' words have worded that is literally saying, didn't you know I had to be doing something for God? Didn't you know that I had to be active uh, about God with something? And, and, and think about that. It, it's incredible. It's, do our lives speak of that service? Well, when Jesus ministered to us on earth, he was able to be focused. He could do what he was doing because he knew his purpose. He knew the plan. He didn't come to be on earth to be exalted by man. He didn't come so that he could be clapped. He knew he didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom. Remember Pontius Pilate said, well, if you're a king, how come your, your guys, your armies aren't here? And he says, it's not about an earthly kingdom. Jesus came to set up the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is, is, it is forever. And, and it is bigger than armies and swords and, and clubs. And so Jesus came to connect us to God. And how did he do it? He set up the kingdom through serving. Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So the very example of Jesus teaches us the power of service. Another reason why Jesus came was to change our perspective. Now prior to his arrival, people were waiting for a conqueror, and they wanted the conqueror to come in and, and brandish a big sword, and ride a white horse, and, and to really kind of to, to settle the oppression down. But they wanted the Messiah to whip the Romans. But Jesus came and he taught them that we're not to follow God like we're to follow in the world, but we're to have a different mentality. So when Jesus served, he teaches us that it's, it's a different mindset. In Luke 22, 26 and 27, it says, But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you shall be the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one is at the table or the one who serves? It's not the one at the table. I am among you is one who serves. And so it says our mindset, you know, we, we think about who is the, is the most important. 
We think about who is the one that gets all the, all the attention. That always amazes me, and I'm not trying to get political, I'm not trying to get mean, but just because someone can act does not mean that they have political opinions. I was amazed this last election on how many celebrities came out. I just want to tell them, go be quiet, go back to Hollywood. Uh, just because you're a good actor, and really an actor makes a, they lie for a living. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, not, they're not who they are, and, and we pay them money to do that. Uh, shame on us. And, and so what's amazing is, is uh, they, we listen to what they said politically. They, they've not, they're not political scientists. They've not done any extra research. They don't know any of that. Why have we given that? Because, again, people tend to, tend to kind of look. I, I got a kick out of last, not this Monday, but two Mondays ago, I looked on Facebook, and the Pickers were here in town. <laughs> and we were so excited. And I thought, why? I mean, yeah, it's neat. I watched the show, but I mean, then these are two guys that go around and get junk. They're junk men. They're nice guys. I know, but they're no more than anybody else. But it always amazes me. Sometimes we want to be uplifted, or we look at people, or we we look at you know the celebrities and things like that. And Jesus teaches us it's not about looking at a person. And so we see that, that James and John approached Jesus. And they said, would you do a favor for me? They wanted Jesus to put in a good word so they could sit on the right, left-hand side for turning. And Jesus knew they still weren't getting what it was totality for them to follow him. And so Jesus went on and explained that they want anything. Look at this. They must become nothing. And this is a, a true follower does not have conditions. And sometimes, folks, as Christians, sometimes we will follow God as long as everything's good. It's easy to follow God as long as he's blessing. It's easy to follow God when we feel okay. But sometimes things don't feel right. Things don't go well. That's when we really follow the Lord. That's when we really, that's when we really deepen. And so James and John, they said, hey, you know, we want to be recognized forever. And Jesus said, you're missing it. And he tells them this in Mark 10, 44. Whoever wants to be the first must be the slave. Now think about that. Must be a slave. And how much rights, how many rights does a slave have? None. None. A slave has absolutely no rights. How much control does a slave have? None. A slave does what they are told. And so that's what Jesus is saying is, is that he actually is becoming, going to become a slave to, for us uh, as he takes our sin on. And so we are to do that as well. Now near the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus, he knew his time was drawing close. He knew it wouldn't be long before he endured the barbaric nature of the cross. He knew he was going to be humiliated and crucified. Yet in spite of that, Jesus still went back to Bethany. And so he went there to serve a family. You remember the story in John 11, Lazarus had died. And Bethany is, is Jerusalem sits on the top of four mounts. And, and so what happens is Bethany is kind of right down in the valley. It's about two miles away. And so Jesus was going back to Bethany where Lazarus had died. And he was very close to where he was going to be grabbed and crucified. And you remember the story at the beginning of John 11. The disciples didn't want to go back. They're like, oh, we don't want to go back. And, and Jesus said, well, he's asleep. And they said, well, if he's asleep, we'll let him sleep. And he said, no, he's dead. Well, if he's dead, we can't do anything. And Jesus said, no, we're going back. And this is what he said in John 11, 7. He said to the disciples, let's go back to Judea. And see, Jesus had a valid reason for serving in this situation. He, he, what he was doing was he was showing them we have to serve in times when we do, it doesn't make sense to us. We have to serve in situations that we may not get anything out of it. We have to serve God at times when we're saying, I don't know why we're doing this. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know why I keep doing this. But we have to because God's going to work things out. Well, once again, the disciples had fallen into the snare of division. They found themselves jockeying for position and trying to be better. And even after they celebrated the First Communion, they're arguing about which one of them was a grace. This amazes me. The very First Communion, what a holy, solemn time. Wow, what an incredible time. Imagine being with Jesus and imagine him looking. I imagine that he looked at each disciple around the table and he said, this is my body and this is going to be broken for you. And, and I, I can imagine that in their throats there was gold. And, and then he took the wine, the cup, and, and we all remember that he lifted the third cup, the cup of redemption, which was making a bold statement, and he said, this cup, this cup, this is my blood, and it will be shed for remission of your sins. I, I mean, the disciples would have been just spellbound. They would have completely just been not able to, to blink or to, to breathe because this was huge. 
So what did they start doing right after they had one of the most holy times with Jesus? What did they start doing? Arguing. <laughs> Arguing. We people are so silly. They just had this incredibly holy time, and they're arguing. And not only that, what are they arguing about? Which one of them was the holiest? Which one of them was the greatest? Isn't that funny? I remember we were in Southern California one time, and we went to a service, and we were praising the Lord. There was, there was uh, 30,000 people in a, in, a, in a ball stadium. We're all praising the Lord. We're all celebrating. Woo! And then as soon as we got in the parking lot, people were running people over. <laughs> and, I, and you go to a Christian concert. You're a Christian concert. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And as soon as you get in the parking lot, get out of here. I hate you. What are you doing? You know. And I'm thinking, that's why the world doesn't come to church. It's because they don't see us, what's matched in the church, out of the church. And so that was a holy, holy time for the disciples. And what do they do? They're arguing. And so what does Jesus do? I mean, does Jesus chew them out? Does Jesus say, you know what, that's it? No, this is what he does. The fullness of his love is found in this. John 13, 1. It was just before the Passover service, a festival. Jesus knew the hour had come for him to leave. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. And in the, in the King James Version, it says he showed them the full extent of his love. You think about the full extent of love, as, as much love as God has. And what did he do? Took off his outer coat, and he washed their feet. This is something not even a slave had to do. See, there were classes of slaves. The, the first class of slaves, the highest, was that of a Jewish person who had to sell himself into slavery because they didn't have enough money. And so that, they, were to be, they were to be treated well. The second class was those who had voluntarily, had in, in the case of a battle or anything like that, voluntarily surrendered. They, they were the second class. And then you had a third and fourth class of slaves, and they were the worst of the worst. They were the ones that, that had been taken in battle. They were the ones that had no authority. And it was those slaves that were to wash the feet of people. Not the Jewish ones, not the middle ones, but the lowest. And Jesus did this. He took on the full extent of that to show his full extent of love. Wow. So what I want you to, to think about this, this day, what's your favorite example of Jesus serving? Now, it could be a healing. It could be a teaching. It could be action. But what in the Bible is, is just the, the one time he served where you were like, wow, this is so cool. And then... I want to ask you a question, and, and, and this may be, this is a harder question than we think. How has God served you? How has God served you? And then, how, what has God done for you? Now, don't give me the pat church answers, everything, every day. How specifically has God served you? What specifically has God done? When we give the church pat answers, when we just say everything, you know, whenever we have an answer in church, it's got to be Jesus, Jesus, you know, wait a second, what is the answer? And sometimes we jump to conclusions. So what has God done for you? And, and why, why would I be kind of pressing you to write specific? Because when we don't remember specifics, what happens is we limit thinking about what God's going to do. When we remember specifics, it reminds us specifically what God is going to do. And so remember the specifics. What key point are you going to take? How are you going to apply? Right at the first 39. 39 books of the Bible. And, and then the memory verse uh, is, is uh, very, very powerful. And the memory verse is John 13, 1. And again, uh, I want you to really, really hit the very last one. What's Exodus. the memory verse? Exodus, Exodus 21. Exodus 21 what? 20 verse 1. 20 verse 1? Yes. Yeah. And, God spoke, and God spoke in the Ten Commandments? Okay. Okay. Well, don't listen to me. Follow the book. <laughs> wow. That's embarrassing. Okay. And so here we see is uh, uh, I have John 13 once. So. If only we had the person that wrote the book. This, well, <laughs> this is the first. This is the first edition, so I must have changed it. <laughs> uh, that's why sometimes when I'm going through here, you're like, "That's not in my book," because th this is this was the the pre book. Uh, that's kind of funny. Okay, well, do what's in your book. Do Exodus chapter twenty, verse one. 
That's funny. And so we'll have you memorize that. And I, by next week, will figure out what it is. All right. I guess I'll have to read the book. Anyway. All right. Serving. Day two. Well, examples of serving. Throughout Scripture, there's some incredible examples of men and women. And, and these are great teaching points, but they're not just for us to look at. They're to guide us. They're to encourage us, but they're to motivate us to do them. So when we serve, we're allowing others to meet God. When we serve, we're his representation. Solomon had everything. I mean, he had wealth, had power, possessions, prestige, and his dad gave him good advice. This is incredible. David told him, he didn't instruct him in management or, or pass on what it meant to be a king, but he told Solomon much, something much more important. He told Solomon to remember the main point. Now, unfortunately, Solomon forgets the main point, and he has to be reminded of it, but this is what David told Solomon, 1 Chronicles 28, 9. And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with unhearted devotion and with a willing mind, for the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and thought. If you seek him, he will, he will be found. If you forsake him, he will reject you. And so what we're told to do is serve God wholeheartedly. Do we serve God with all that we are? Do we serve God with, without holding back at all? Jesus told a story that possessed an unlikely heroine, and the hero he selected, this is incredible, was one that would have caused the Jewish people to stand up and boo. I mean, a Samaritan. We've got to remember the Jewish people hated Samaritans. They hated Samaritans because they felt that they had forsaken the gods. They had the, the troops that came in, the Assyrians and Babylonians and all the, the troops. They came through Samaria. The Samaria people helped them, and they overtook uh, the Israelites. And, and so this, this was something that went way back. And so when Jesus said there's a good Samaritan, the, the uh, Jewish people, would have, they would have fled. That would have been so hard for them. They wouldn't have been able to understand that. And so, but what's interesting is that Jesus is teaching that the acts of a good Samaritan are what we do. Luke 10, 34. The good Samaritan went to the man and banished his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And so this is what's fascinating, is Jesus was pointing out that here this man, remember, you remember the story, the who walked by, or the first guy walked by was what? A priest. And the second guy walks by is what? Levi, these are the religious leaders and the rulers. These are the church people. And then who helps them? A despised, despicable Samaritan. The very worst. And so what Jesus is teaching them is, you know what? It's not about what you say. It's not about what you believe. It's about what you do. And that is so true. And, and that's, I, I, I guess as a pastor, that's my heart's cry. Because I know many, many, many people who know the, what they need to do. I know many people who can tell you the Bible back and forth, but they're not living it. And until we live it, it this head knowledge isn't going to do us any good. Until it becomes heart knowledge, before, until it becomes part of our life, it's really not going to make a difference. And so Jesus is teaching them, you know what? Hey, it's about serving. It's not about how you look or the robes you wear or the title you have. It's about serving. When we serve, there's going to be times it's going to have sacrifice. There's times when we serve and it costs us something. And the greater the cost, the more, the deeper the impact of the effect the service could have. And Jesus gives us an example of a woman used some extremely expensive perfume to anoint Jesus. And I love this. It says the fragrant aroma of her service spread beyond her immediate location. And when we serve, it ripples out far than we can see. This is one of my favorite passages. Pastor, you have a lot of favorite passages. I know. John 12, 3. Uh, Mary took a pint of, of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I love that passage. Because remember, there's a, there's a whole crowd of a house. There's a whole bunch of people. And they're all crowded to try to get close to Jesus. And Mary comes in and she's got a very expensive jar. This alabaster jar. And she breaks that. And she pours this perfume all over the feet of Jesus. And this was, the scholars say, about a year's wages. A year's wages. What would happen next week if I said, hey, everybody, you're going to tithe your year's wages. <laughs> You'd say, I knew I wanted to be Baptist. You know, <laughs> Baptist church sure is calling me. You, you know, you, you'd want to get converted really easy. And, and, and that's what happened. She took a year's wages and she poured them on his feet. Imagine what would have happened. And what was incredible is every room in the house was filled. 
And what happens is, it tells us, that's what's so beautiful, it's the fragrance of the, of the perfume filled the whole room. So what she did right there wafted, and it did so much. I have told you this before, I am only here before you because of the prayers of a godly grandmother and mother. And, and the grandma, none of you met her, and, and, and uh, you'll see her in heaven. Uh, you'll see her, she's going to be one walking around with Jesus. And, and, and she's just an incredible godly woman. But it's interesting, her service to me has made an impact when I was just a little guy so many times. And so when we serve, think about how it makes a ripple impact. Now when we're selfish, what does that do? That sucks it all in. When we're selfish, when we make it about us, when we're the distraction, when we're the obstacle, what are we doing? We're taking that ripple and we're taking it into ourselves. But when we serve, it's just like Mary took that, that pint of perfume and it, it just it went through and it, it went places that we had no idea. And when you serve, you'll make a greater difference than you'll ever know. I, I believe that, that song, Thank You for Giving to the Lord. You remember that Ray Bolt song? I, I believe that there's going to be times in heaven when someone comes up and says, you know what, because you gave, I was impacted. Well, how? You just were. And it, it, it's amazing to me how, how much smaller the world is becoming. It, it is amazing me incredibly because what's, what's happening is when we start doing, you do a good thing, you, you get a like on Facebook, there's 8 million likes. You know why? Because people want good, they want to see good news. They want to see the good, so serve. Another phenomenal example of service is when we give all we have to the Lord. There's a scripture, a woman didn't have much, but she gave all she had. And when we serve, it may require all. Luke 21, 12, there's a poor widow, and she put in two very small copper coins. We know this as the widow's what? Might. The widow's might. And that, what's great is Jesus is hanging out there. And that's why he, he, it's very scriptural. When we pass the offering plate, it's very scriptural to know Jesus is standing right there. He did it. You know, that's why people say, well, I don't want to get into tithing. You better. Scripturally, very, very clearly you need to be tithing. And what happened was, is Jesus was watching what the people were giving. And he's, this little woman comes in, and, and I believe that she's just barely shuffling. And the, the, the temple coffers, what they were, is they were basically kind of rounded at the bottom, and they, they looked like bugles. They, they kind of twisted up, and they were made of brass. And so when you threw coins in there, they'd go... <laughs> And so if you threw a lot, you could really kind of, look at me. <laughs> yeah, that's what I gave. <laughs> and, and so what happened is I believe that she barely shuffled. And, and as she drops her widow's mite, it probably barely made a sound. Maybe even a teak, just a teak. And the disciples are kind of checking her out. And that's why Jesus said, you see that? She gave more than all of this because she gave all she had. Are we giving all we have to Jesus? Or are we just throwing in a little bit? In order not to be selfish, we need to serve. One of the greatest tragedies and burdens that we're facing in society is people think that they're owed something without doing something. That entitlement. We're surrounded by those who have that mentality. They feel that they should be taken care of without doing their part. And sometimes we Christians can slip on this. Well, God owes me. I went to church Sunday. God owes me to, to quit having a headache. God owes me because I, I threw in an extra dollar at the offering plate. Sometimes we have that entitlement mentality. But here's what happens. When we serve, it helps us, not to, it helps us see it's not about us. 2 Thessalonians 3.8, Nor did we eat anyone's food without paying. On the contrary, we worked day and night, laboring and toiling, so we would not be a burden to any of you. This is what Paul said. Paul said, you know what? We came to give. We're not, we're, not, we're not here to receive. We're here to give. And because of that, he was able to proclaim the gospel to the church in Thessalonica. So a way we can serve one another is to acknowledge the importance of each other. Each one of us can learn something from each other. Each one of us can benefit each other. We're to submit to each other. To submit means to humbly receive and respect. And we submit as we serve. And so service is a perfect expression of submission. Ephesians 5.21, it says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We are to submit to one another. We have a tough time with that. We, we want to be the boss. Don't tell me what to do. I, I get a kick sometimes. I've had Christians say, don't, 
I'm not going to listen to a pastor. <laughs> well, then you're in trouble. <laughs> if you're not going to listen to someone who's, who's saying what God's saying, then, then you're in deep weeds. But sometimes we, we do it. Now, we may put the church face on, <coughs> but then we're not listening. And if we're not submitting, we're not getting it. And so sir, when we serve, it helps us to realize we're helping. We are giving. It's not about us. It's not about taking. It's giving. And we serve because we love. Love is not simply a four-letter word. It's not a catchphrase to be the subject of songs and poems. Love is action. You've heard me say this many times. Love can be seen. When we serve, we're showing the greatest demonstration. <laughs> Jesus didn't just tell us he loved us stand in heaven. He just didn't say, I love you. He came down. And those who served us have done so out of love. And so let's do the same. When we love, we will serve. Hebrews 13, 1, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. If we're not serving each other, how are we loving each other? And, and, and when we say we love someone, we will serve them. Again, love can be seen. This is what I want you to do on, on day two. I want you to write down three people who have served you. Three people in your life that have served you. And what I want you to do is write down how they impacted you. And there's a reason for that. Because when we start processing, when we start thinking about, okay, this is how this person impacted me, then what will happen is we'll start thinking, who am I impacting? Who am I making? Whose life is better because I'm here? You know, what was that uh, Jimmy Stewart's uh, uh, Wonderful Life? Wasn't it where he, he wondered if he had ever been born, what would happen? That's a wonderful life, isn't that the one? And, and how true that is. And so are we truly making a difference? And we do by serving. Now, now once you write down the names of, of who has served you and how you've impacted, look at this. If they're still alive, tell them what you've written. Tell them what you've written. If they're with the Lord, thank the Lord for allowing them to be a part of your life. But why would you do that? I'll tell you why. Because every single one of us needs encouragement. And every single one of us, we don't know how we've impacted people. I, I, it's been incredible. Uh, I, I, you know, again, I get on Facebook every now and then. And, 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 uh, but it's fascinating. I had a young man, Bracken Mc, uh, McMillan, and he actually got hold of me. He was one of my youth. 26 years ago, as, as a youth pastor, I didn't know if he was going to make it because I was going to give him a holy hug around the neck. He just, he was just, he, every nerve I had, he got on it. Cutest blonde hair, blue eyed, South California surfer. I wanted him just to go in the ocean. I mean, this kid just, he was nutty. He was just insane. And he got hold of me on Facebook and he said, Pastor, I'm a youth pastor now. Oh, and I sit in a church. <laughs> <laughs> well, God is. <laughs> and and he, he, we, we texted or what are you do on Facebook, whatever you do. And, and we, we talked back and forth. And, and so what was so funny is, is he said, I remember some lessons he taught. And I said, what? And he listed them. <laughs> And, and, it, and that humbled me so much because it, you know, there were times when I would leave you and Jeannie would say, don't go get your gun. Don't get it. He'll be okay. And I'm like, I got to kill him. I got to put him out of all of our misery. And, and you think I'm joking. Okay. Oh, like, oh you're right. We're in church. I got to talk to uh, and, and so, I mean, he frustrated me to no end. And now he's leading people to the Lord. And so every now and then on Facebook, I just led one of my youth to the Lord. And, and it's funny, uh, about a month ago, he, he uh, whatever, what do you do at Facebook? He message. emailed a message? Okay, message. whatever. He messaged me and he said, I just led one of my youth to the Lord and he was a big pain. And I was like, that's what you deserve. Right? <laughs> that's, what, that's your fault. So anyway, so, but tell someone, tell someone. Okay, day three. We are commanded to serve. And you're going to say, Pastor, you just preach on this. Isn't it funny how God, God wants us to hear this. Isn't it funny God's timing? Uh, and so here, here we see. We are expected to serve. We didn't get saved to sit back. We're not saved simply to let the world pass us by. We're here to make a difference. God clearly states many times that we're to serve. We're to make disciples and, and we accomplish this by serving. So when we're serving, we're filling a direct order. There are those in powerful positions when Jesus was on, uh, on earth in human form, and they love to be the center of attention. 
They thoroughly appreciate the fanfare. But yet Jesus says that you've got to serve. You're drawing from God's power. If we want to be great, we have to be less. Matthew 23, 11, The greatest among you shall be the servant. And this is what Jesus is pounding. He's continually pounding us. It's not about you. It's about God. It's not about God. Give, give, give me, 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 take, take, take. It's about giving to others. It's about being there for others. And it, it's not easy to serve. And it's easy to become frustrated when we serve because uh, it never can be good enough. We can, it can be easy because some people are only happy. They want, they want you to give more and more. And they drain us and expect us more and more. But remember, when we're serving, we're serving the Lord. So when you're serving someone, you are doing that as if you're serving to the Lord. Look what Ephesians 6, 7 says. Very powerful. Serve wholeheartedly as if you're serving the Lord, not people. So when you get frustrated, when you get tired, remember, you are serving God, not necessarily that person. And, and when we, what we do is we can allow the enemy says, oh, you've done so much for them. Why do you keep helping them? Why do you keep going above and beyond? And you know they don't appreciate it. You know they're going to complain. You know that they're just never going to stop whining. And that's when you remember, I, I'm not serving them. I'm serving God. I, it's about Him. Well, God's place is here for a specific uh, season or reason. And we're here as disciples to be witness. And our lives are to impact those we contact. And there's des those there who desperately need help. There are those who are not as fortunate as us, and God has blessed us. We're commanded to help those less fortunate. Deuteronomy 15, 11, There will always be poor people in the land, therefore I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. You know what's interesting is, is we have relegated the, 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 the government to take care of the needs instead of really that's the church's job. <laughs> and, and what has happened is, is the government has set up a, a, a terrible welfare system, and, and I'm not slamming any of that. I'm just saying it, it's ineffective. And so really, if we as the churches, if we did our job, think of what a different world it would be. And if we truly, truly helped, if we truly looked out, if we truly gave, what a difference it could be. This is a bold statistic. If every Christian tithed 10%, we would have enough money to feed every hungry person in the world. If every Christian in the United States tithed, just in the United States, world hunger would be obliterated. So that's a twofold problem. First of all, not all Christians are tithing. But second of all, or are we tithing and do we just keep it here? Do we just look at ourselves and, and do we get so caught up when there's so many that need help? And so remember, we are here to help those who are unfortunate. God's given us a certain time on earth. One day we're all going to fall asleep. Whenever you read fall asleep in the Bible, it doesn't mean take a nap. It means you're going to be dead. And so during that time period, we're going to accomplish what God has for us. God has plans. Plans to do great things. Plans to fulfill His mission. Plans to live high as cross. And see, when we serve, we're productive for God. I, I like Titus 3.14. It says, People must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. You are not here just to live to be 70 to 80 and then die and then be preach your funeral and then to come and uh, have us eat chicken dinners. That's not why you're here. You are here to make a difference. You are here to change this world. Whether it's one person in your life, whether it's a community, whether it's a world, whatever it is, you are here to make a difference. Don't let the enemy tell you that you're not important. Don't let the enemy beat down what you have. You have plans. God has something for you to change the world. And it may just be one person. And that one person may be one person. And that one person will change one person. And so don't ever forget that we are here. We're here to make a difference. John the Baptist served, and he preached the kingdom of God was near and proclaimed Jesus the Messiah, and he also baptized. And he knew that to be a disciple, you had to serve. To be a disciple means that we're here for others. And so Luke 3.11, John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Wow, do any of us have more than two shirts? And so when we think about it, we are so blessed here. One reason why uh, uh, in, in a couple of years from now, we're going to 
probably start going to, to mission trips and things like that outside the country. And uh, one of the reasons why I, I lead people in trips like that is because we are spoiled. We have so much. And when I take you to Haiti and you meet a, a, a mother who has to walk literally six miles before she can carry a bucket back, and that's the only clean water that she has, I introduce you to people that they have one shirt, and, and that shirt is meticulous because every night they clean that shirt. But what happens is we realize, boy, we are so spoiled. When we're thirsty, we walk to that sink. Well, we don't like that sink water, so we have to buy Avion or uh, Propel. Okay? <laughs> and, so, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing us. I'm just saying uh, God has blessed us. And, and to whom much is given, Luke 12, 48, what? Much is required or expected. And so what I, I want to encourage us as folks too often, well, I don't have as much as Bill Gates. I don't, I don't have as much as, as that person. You know what? No, but we have a whole lot. Every one of us is rich. Every one of us is filthy rich compared to 80% of the world. And so I want to strongly encourage us. Let us never take it for granted. Let's remember that we have what we have to bless, to give. So... Okay, it's not easy to serve. Well, when is someone going to serve me? Or how can I get everything done that I have to get done and, and take care of others? How can I get my honey-do list checked off if I have to do something for someone else? Remember, it's a lifestyle of having a servant lifestyle. It's about our mindset that we are here to help others. Hebrews 13, 16, look at this. Do not forget to do good and to share with others. For such sacrifices God is pleased. I don't know about you, but I like when God is pleased with me. I like that. And so this is flat, tells us God is very simple. God tells us in, in James 1.26, pure religion, this is what I, I love. And he says to take care of the widows and the orphans and keep oneself unpolluted from the world. I, I mean, God very simply tells us what he wants out of us, what he expects. And he tells us here, don't forget to do good. Don't forget to do good or to share. And he, he says, I love that. I'm pleased with that. So we need to do it. It all boils down to love. Twice in 1 John we see that God is love. 1 John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 16. And, and we see that since God is love, we're to love. And how do we love? We serve. Matter of fact, if someone says they love you and they're not serving in some capacity, then that's lip service. And, and us, if we say, oh, we love you, but we're not doing anything, that's just lip service. So love is action. 1 John 3, 14. Uh, 318, I'm sorry. First John 318. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Let us do our part. So this is a question I have for you. Are we serving? How? What are we doing for the Lord? And, and so I want you to be specific. I mean, what are you doing for the Lord? And how are you serving? And it, it could be in your workplace, it could be in your family, it could be in your community, but how are you serving? How are others around you able to say, you know what, I'm, I am being impacted by this person in this way. Remember earlier, the day before, we're looking through the people who've impacted us? Well, now how are we impacting others? Why would someone write our name down? And, and why would someone say that we're serving them? And so that's so important. Well, there's some consequences if we don't serve. And as we uh, work repeatedly through, through uh, One Step Closer, we've seen we are going to give an account of, of our life to the Lord. Fourteen times in Scripture, it says you will give an account of your life to the Lord. So, you know, sometimes they say, well, I'm saved, I'm just going to skate in. No, we're still going to appear before the Lord. And, and we're going to give an account of our life. And, and there is a cost in being a disciple. We can't get saved and just sit back and get a get-out-of-hell-free card. We have to serve. And if we're not serving, we're not only hurting others, but we're hurting ourselves. We're damaging us. So when we serve, we make a difference. So we have to be real about who and what we're serving. And if we're only serving us, we're not really serving God. And sometimes people try to serve God on a part-time basis, and they're missing out. You can't straddle a fence. You have to choose if you're going to serve God or not. So if we're choosing to serve God wholly, if we're not choosing to serve God wholly, we're not choosing to serve God. We're choosing not to serve God. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so what happens is, are we truly serving God? Are we serving God with all that we are? Is that what we're truly seeking after? 
when we're generous and we're, we're giving uh, sparingly and serving, God loves to bless us. God really does love to bless us. It, it's incredible. Uh, when you give, when you serve, you will be blessed. Now, if you're doing it, so look at me. You won't get the recognition. <laughs> it's, it's not about that. But when you serve in, in a godly way, in a, in a way of love, you will be blessed beyond you can even understand. Uh, and in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says, Whoever sows so sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. And it's the same when we serve. When we serve, <coughs> man, God honors that. Well, I, I love my wife with all my heart. I, she is the greatest gift under, under salvation to me. And, and it, it's just incredible. And, and you know, there will be times, I'll, I'll be honest, there will be times I'll be the guy, you know, I'll be sitting there and she'll come home and she'll start cleaning up the house and, and, and I'll be like, do you want any help? And what does she say? Yes. No. no. She says, I'll take care of it. And you know what then God says? Get out of that chair, you big baby. <laughs> Wake you up. Mary, are you okay, Mary? Okay. And so, and so I'm like, but Lord, I worked hard today. I didn't work to see all those church people. It was so hard. And he said, did she work? Yeah. Do you love her? Yeah. Get out of that chair. And so you know what? She's around and I'll say, hey, you know what? Let me do this. I'll tell you what. Woo! You husbands, just do it. That's all I'm going to say. You want some good husband points? Do the dishes. What's he Statistically, no man has ever been shot by his wife while he was doing the dishes. <laughs> now, men have been shot by their wives. It's true. But none, none while they were doing the dishes. Or while they're fixing dinner. Or while they're fixing dinner. You, you got, I'm just trying to help you guys. If I have to do your funeral because you got shot, I'm going to say I told them. They didn't listen. All right. And, and I don't know where we're going. So, all right. So, <laughs> let's make sure that we're giving. And, and I, the point I was making it is that when I see my wife serving, I say, wait a second. I love her. I want to serve. And, and I, I'm not doing it, to, uh, you know, because I have to. But I'm doing it because she's doing She's serving me. And the more she serves me, the more I want to serve her. It, it's that exchange back and forth. So God promises to take care of Look at what Proverbs 11.25, very powerful. Generous people will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. I, I was thinking about when I was looking over this lesson again, I, I was thinking about, you know, just frumpy, grumpy people. And, and, and they're kind of, no, I'm not looking at anybody. I, you know, they're, they're all looking at me like, he mean me. Um, you know, and, and they got that just kind of crusty, kind of, you know, scaled over, you know, and hi, have a nice day, and you do. Ooh. <laughs> you know, you get scared, and, and, and it, it hits me, that impact they have. But what happens when you see someone that, that pleasantly shows you the love of Christ and the joy of Jesus is shining through them? Man, that just gets you going. That just gets you going. So, uh, but we're not, are we not saved by having faith alone? Yes. There's nothing we can do uh, or great thing we can accomplish to bring salvation. So we're not serving to, to get to heaven. We are saved through the grace of God through faith. That service doesn't have anything to do with salvation. You can serve all day long. Matter of fact, there's a lot of people in churches who are serving, and that doesn't mean they know Jesus. To know Jesus, to be saved, is a relationship. And so, but once we get saved, then we serve. Once we get saved, then we're to step up our lives. So we're in a healthy relationship, we work together. So do we really have faith if we're not serving? And what is James 2.17? He says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, it's dead. Some of you have memorized the King James Version, faith without works is dead. And, and so that's what I want to encourage you. Remember, when there's true faith, that action will always happen. In Scripture, we see that God rewards those who serve, and he outlines this truth. You know, too many people, when we think of service, we think this grand, auspicious sales, scales, and things. God will only serve, uh, you know, will only bless us if we serve like 10 billion, like McDonald's. But that's not accurate. God rewards our obedience. And when we serve God in small acts, and we might even think they're, they're a big deal. We might even not think, oh, there's nothing to it. God does. Just giving someone a drink. Matthew 10, 42. If any of you gives even a drink of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, 
Truly I tell you, that person will not lose their reward. Just a drink of water. Amazing. And, and sometimes we have to say, well, how can I serve God? How can I serve God? You can serve God by holding the door open. It amazes me when I hold the door open for people. Many times I've had people say, you must be a Christian. I'm thinking, are we in such a sick world that if I hold the door open for someone, they think I'm a Christian? Are we, are we that bad? Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. Mm -hmm. And so think about the little things. Think about the little things. It doesn't have to be something real big, but it's the little things. And at times, uh, the disciples were serving to catch the attention of Jesus. They wanted to see what a good job they were doing. They wanted to know that they were the greatest. And several times throughout the Gospels, we see disciples arguing. And when we serve, we have to have the right motive. Mark 9, 35, the disciples again were arguing about which one of them was the greatest. And Jesus sat him down. <laughs> and he says, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. You know, you know I, I, I love the Lord on, on so many different levels and ways, but it's always incredible because there's times when, when uh, you know, I'll work out a lesson or a sermon, I'll say, whoo, Lord, man, this is a good one. Boy, you gave it to me. I'll preach it, and it's crickets. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Lord, what was wrong with them? And he said, it wasn't them. And there's times when, when I said, Lord, boy, I, I, I just don't feel this. This is just hard. And he'll say, let me be God. And that's when all of a sudden... I get comments or someone will come up, you know that sermon you preached a year ago, that impacted my life. I'm thinking, that one did? Are you sure? And again, it's not about us. It's about him. It's about people seeing him. It's about us being faithful. It's about us serving. So we have to have the right motive. Now there's a, a well proverbial saying that says, I can't hear what you're saying because what you're doing is screaming. Our actions speak louder than words. What we do drowns out what we say. Many people see what we do and what we do not do. So there's evidence if one is a disciple. And it doesn't matter what you say here. It matters of what your life is showing. Malachi 3.18. And you again will see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. There is a difference. I'm not saying we Christians are any better, but we are forgiven. And as Christians, as disciples, we are to be striving to be more like Christ. And we are to be serving others. We've looked at the commands of God for us to serve. And therefore, if we're not being obedient, there are consequences. And, and there can be no misunderstanding. God intends for us and wants us to serve. So we are to serve. 1 Peter 4.10 Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others. A faithful steward of God's grace in its various forms. So I want you on this day to be very honest. What can stop us from serving the Lord? What obstacles or distractions get in our way? What are we using as excuses? Well, I can't serve here because I don't have time. We have time for what's important to us. I can't serve here because I'm no good at it. Well, if God calls you to it, you don't got to be good at it. That's where God is good. Well, I can't do this because this won't work. You know what? You're not God. And so what we need to do is, is we need to ask ourselves, what's blocking us from serving? What is stopping us? It could be something in the past. It could be an attitude. It, it, it could be someone we're connected to. Whatever it is. What obstacle? And this is what I want us to really think about. What can we do to overcome that so we can serve? What is getting in the way of us serving? It could be friendship. It could be all kinds of things. What's blocking us from serving? And, and we need to look at that. All right, day five. And this is so neat. When we think about, this is how I, I want you to kind of start thinking about service. I, I love worship. Do you all love worshiping? Yes. I mean, it, worship is a time, remember the definition of, of uh, uh, Robert Morris, is a, the definition of worship is God meeting man and man meeting God. Is We have an opportunity to connect with the Almighty. You know, and and. When we serve, that actually is worship. You know, too many times in, in church we think, okay, worship is the four songs we do, and then we got to hear the sermon, and then we get to worship again. And, and so what we do is, is we miss sight of that. It's all worship. And when we serve, that's actually worship. And so worship is when man meets God, and one of the greatest ways we can meet God is when we're doing what God wants us to do. So serving is worship. We're not only obeying God, but we're representing God. 
uh, the book of Deuteronomy is a great book. And, and it outlines and describes how the Israelites can connect with God and talk about their deliverance and expectations. And it guides the Israelites, but the lessons were taught so long ago are for us now. And a basis for worship is our service. Deuteronomy 13.4, it is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. Remember the definition of worship? Man meeting God, serve him and hold fast to him. So as we're serving, we're, we're actually drawing close to God. When we're actually giving unconditionally, when we're giving, not, not with bad motivation, when we're giving so that God is honored, we actually are drawing close to God. I've got a beautiful, beautiful painting uh, uh, Janine gave to me, uh, I think when I got my doctorate, I don't remember when, but uh, it's a beautiful painting, and it's a, if you're ever in my office, and it's of a pastor preaching, and surrounding all of him are all the saints of the church, Peter and Paul and Moses and Elijah and Jesus, and, and they're, all, they're all around. And when she got that for me, I actually, the first time I saw it, it, it actually paralyzed me. I actually, I, I mean, I stopped. And, and, and it shook me, and, and I, I actually started weeping because it hit me. That's why, folks, whoo, I do not take preaching or teaching lightly at all. I am speaking for God. And, and that's why I want you to make sure I'm in the Word. I want you to make sure it's biblical. And if, if I'm being biblical and in the Word and, and God's doing it, you better listen because it's Him speaking. And what amazes me, though, is it's just not me up here. They're surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses. All those who've been faithful. And so what I think when I preach is, man, I, I, I've got Moses standing next to me saying, oh yeah. I've got Peter standing up. And most important is Jesus Christ is here. Wow. That's pretty cool. And that's when you serve. When you're serving someone... I want you to imagine those saints around there. I want you to imagine Jesus washing the feet when you're there. I want you to imagine Mary breaking that, bar, that jar of perfume. I want you to imagine Peter saying, I'm going to go with you, Jesus. I, I want you to, to see yourself as, as, let this be a time of worship. An aspect of meeting God and worshiping is to be awed how good God is. God is better to us than we deserve. Anyone want to amen that? Amen. God is so, did you get up this morning? Did you thank God? Did we this morning thank God we were able to open our eyes? Did we thank God this morning that we were able to hear? Did we thank God we were able to put our feet on the floor? You know, many could not put their feet on the floor. Did we thank God that we were able to take a step? Many cannot take a step. Pastor, if I did that, I'd be thanking God all day. Amen. <laughs> God is so good to us. And we take it for granted. And so remember, when we serve, it, it helps us to remember how good God is. And we appreciate that, that he's holding us in the palm of his hand. So when we serve, we're understanding, uh, we're worshiping by understanding what God's done. 1 Samuel 12, 24. Be sure to fear the Lord and serve faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. And God has done so much for us. And, and he's constantly doing for us. He's constantly taking care of us. Constantly aware. He's constantly providing. He's constantly protecting. He's constantly guide you over and over again. And so let us never forget that. So when we serve, we're saying, Lord, thank you for being there with me. And then it pleases him. When we serve, we're not just serving others. When we serve, we're being obedient, but it's something bigger. When we serve, we're serving God. So we are serving him. And when we worship, we serve because it serves is meeting God. Matthew 25, 40, the king will reply, truly, whatever you've done for the least of these brothers, you've done for me. And so think about that. When we are giving to someone, we are truly doing it for the Lord. And, and that is such a joy. We're able to worship because we've been set free. We've been rescued from a prison cell of sin. We're pardoned from transgressions bigger than us. We're not locked in cages of self-despair anymore. We're set free, and because of that, we want everyone else to be free. We want those in, their li in our lives to come out of prison cells. And we worship because we're free. Galatians uh, uh, 5.13, it says, You, my brothers and sisters, we're called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Man, Pastor, there's a bunch of verses about service in here. Oh, yeah. And we're just scratching the surface. I mean, I think it's very clear we are to serve. We're not only set free by the blood that was shed by Jesus, but we're cleansed. 
We're whole. We're, we're not limited. We're not halfway. You can't be half saved. It's kind of like pregnant. You either are or you're not. And so you're either saved or you're not. And so we, that's how we need to be. And, and, and we're not beat down. We're complete. And since we're complete, we can worship. We can lift our hearts. As we worship that we've been cleansed, we can serve. What's so incredible when God forgives us? Do you know that we have a complete clean slate? Wow, isn't that incredible? All of that is gone. He doesn't remember any of that. Now we do, and the devil throws it up at us, but that's when we need to remind the devil, and ah, God's cleansed me. I'm a brand new person. Look at this, Hebrews 9, 14. How much more will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished cleanse our consciences from the acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Notice that we were dead, but we have been cleansed so we can serve the living God. Our God is alive. And, and, and he is on his throne and he's in control. And, and, and you know, when you watch the news, I, I watch the news, I try to, to be uh, abreast of what's going on in the world. And, and I watch the news and then I got to go pray. <laughs> because I'm like, I can't, I'm not going to get discouraged. I, I know that the world is a mess. And every time I turn around, something else crazy is happening. But you know what? God is still on his throne. And he's still in control. And, and Scripture clearly says that people are just going to be foolish. People, scripture clearly says people will be lovers of themselves. And, and, and it's going on and on and on. So this is what the, the Bible has said. This is what's, what is happening. The Bible has said this. this is, God is not going, man, they're getting really bad. He knew all this. But he has us here to show them there is a God. And that's why I, I feel now is the time that the church is more important than ever before. And I'm not saying that egotistically. I'm just telling you, I believe that the world is in such a state, they have got to see Jesus. And, and they, they are not going to come running into church unless they see the church in us. They're not going to come running to the Lord unless they see the real thing. And that's why when we're a true disciple and when we serve, Man, God does some incredible things. Another reason why we have to worship as we serve is we don't have to have serve utilizing our own strength. We don't have to be in control. We don't have to be in charge. We can serve by the strength of the Spirit. And we can be empowered to worship by worship to serve. And, and this is what's interesting. When we serve filled with the Holy Spirit, it's beautiful worship. Look at Romans 7, 6. It says, Now by dying, by what's bound us, we've been released from the law, so we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Too many times Christians are trying to do it themselves. There is a power here. There is a strength called the Holy Spirit. And when we are serving, we are being that representation. The Holy Spirit is here to dwell within us, to give us that strength, to give us that power, to, to enable us to take one more step. And when we say, I can't do it, that's when the Holy Spirit says, I can help you. And, and I, you can do all things through what? Christ. Through Christ. And, and notice it says, I can do all. But sometimes what we do is we quote that verse, I can do some things. Or I can do a few things. No, 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 that's not what that verse says. I can do all things, but we've got to catch, through Christ who strengthens us. And so I want to encourage you to so let the Holy Spirit fill you. And as you, if the Holy Spirit fills you, He is going to prompt you to action. The Holy Spirit just doesn't come and hang out. He didn't just sit in your life and kumbaya, kumbaya, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved. Feel good, feel good, feel good. He says, you've got work to do. We've got something to do. We've got to make a difference in this world. I, I, be, I, am, I believe this with all my heart. I believe that we are missing out on God doing so many incredible things because we're sitting back. Because we're sitting back and we're comfortable. I want to come to enough church to be able to say, God bless you when someone sneezes. I want enough church to, to feel good for me. It's not about us feeling good. It's about us receiving that power that God has for us. I, I, I believe that we, we as Christians have the utmost power. Jesus said that, that we're going to do greater things than he did. He raised the dead. He touched, he healed the blind. He had those who were deaf were able to hear. Those who couldn't walk could jump up. Those are pretty cool things. And we can do greater? Wow. But why are we not? Because I think we're trying to do it. And we're not serving. 
And I'm not slamming any of us in here. As I look through, many of you are utmost servants. Sometimes we're serving with wrong motives, though. Sometimes we're serving because we've always served that way. Or sometimes we're serving because I feel guilty. If you're serving because of guilt, then you're not doing it for the right most reason. When you serve because you're serving God, that's when great things, that's when worship. Now, a beautiful aspect of worship is when we worship now, we're only scratching the surface of what worship is going to be in paradise. We're able to meet God now, but only through limited access. Think about heaven for a second. You know, I get, I get, you guys are going to get me wound up tonight. I want to settle down. Uh, we're almost there. Hang on. Uh, you, you know, I, heaven is, cracks me up. In heaven, we're going to sit around and play euchre all day. Is euchre really the funnest thing you do in life? If it is, there's some other stuff. And I love playing euchre. Uh, he plays cards. Uh, not very well, but that's all right. It's not a sin if you don't play very well. And so, anyway, we get so excited. I want a street of gold in heaven. You want gold in heaven? Heaven is going to be bigger and better and brighter and more incredible than we could even imagine. I mean, the, the, most, the most incredible place or thing that you could see, that's what heaven is going to be like. And, and, and so I, I just get amazed by the, that us as Christians that, that we kind of try to, to, to bring it down. But in heaven, we're going to be completely in the presence of God. I, I, I don't think we get that. For eternity. You know, in heaven, we're going to be like, eh, hey, high five all the time. I think we're going to see Jesus. I think we're going to be wow for eternity. Are we going to get bored? Uh-uh. I think that's how big God is. I think for heaven, I mean, what do the angels in heaven do? What does it tell us in Scripture? Worship. Worship. They bow down. It doesn't say that the angels have a bridge club. <laughs> it, it doesn't say that, you know, the angels are over here, you know, racing cars. I mean, what are the angels doing? They're, they're around the throne going, wow, holy, holy, holy. And, and the, remember the angels, the cherubim, seraphim, have all the eyes all around them, all the wings, six wings, all that kind of stuff. And I believe it's because everywhere they look, they are amazed by God. That's what heaven's going to be like. And so when we worship, when we worship, what that does is that allows us to capture a little bit of heaven. It allows us to have that fill our soul. And don't you, when you help someone out, don't you feel better? When you truly give, don't you feel good? Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So this is what I want you to ask yourself. What are some times you were serving and you truly felt you had a worship experience? So what was a time that you service, served and it was worship? And, and, and uh, it, incredible, there, there's, there's opportunities for you to give to God, and as you give to God, just to let him wow you. Let him wrap your arm, let him wrap his arms of love around you. When, when you serve, just say, wow, Lord, thank you for letting me do this. Thank you for letting me have this opportunity. And this is what I want to ask, for you to ask yourself. How can we incorporate more worship into service? Sometimes we let the devil beat us up and, oh, I have to do this. I have to go here. I, I have to perform this. I have to do And what we do is we don't have any joy. How can we recapture worship to where we're excited, to, to where we're just on fire for the Lord? Do we wake up in the morning and do we say, good morning, Lord? Or do we wake up in the morning and say, Good Lord, morning. <laughs> what do we do? Do we take this as an opportunity to serve? And when you have an opportunity to serve, remember, you're doing this for God. And we're going to give an account for our life. And remember, it's not about us. It's about someone seeing Him. I believe that when we truly serve, get out of the way. Because God does great things. And, and too often we get, we get caught up in that and, and we complicate it and we make rules. We love to make rules, don't we? We're just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees had 10 commandments. They made 36,390 laws for those 10 commandments. You know, and, and so we get so trapped up in that. Just serve God. Serve Him. Love Him. And as you serve Him, remember that's worship. Let yourself experience Him. All right.
Well, I'm going to bless you all, and then I'm going to ask you to serve each other by going to someone that you've not talked to yet today, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask you to tell them, to tell them that you love them. I love you. And don't just say, hey, I love you. That, that's really not service. That's just kind of, okay, the preacher said we've got to do it, and he's standing at the door, and he's going to be watching. Uh, when we love each other, when we serve, hang on, Rich. Settle down. Settle down. Settle down, Rich. All right. Get behind me, Satan. Um, <laughs> um, when we serve, when we serve, when you, we truly love each other, it makes a difference. So I want to encourage you. Go to say, we always do the people next to you. I love you. I love you. Yeah, I, I, they know that. You know, there's, there's more people in the church than just one pew. <laughs> no, that's my cue. I know, I know. And, and sometimes we forget that. I mean, it's funny. I know if you're here or not, I just look in a certain area. If you all ever sat in different places, I'd be like, what church am I at? And so anyway, what I want you to do is I want you to go to someone and I want you to say, I love you. So stand with me. Father, we love you. We uh, just are so thankful. You're so good to us. You're better than us. We deserve. And I ask, Father, at this time that you will bless my brothers and sisters. Lord, as I look out, so many serve you in so many ways. Father, bless them for their efforts. Bless them for their faithfulness. Lord, and, and sometimes we, we fall into the trap of, of mixing service with obligation. And with obligation, we get weary. We get beat down. With service, we're worshiping. And so I ask, Lord, that we will recapture that love of service to where it is worship. And to where we, we have that joy of the Lord. And Lord, and I ask, Father, that we will think about those who served us and praise you for them and let them know. And also, Father, may we make a difference. This world needs the church. And so let us be the church. And so I ask, Lord, that you'll sweep through the sanctuary, sweep through our hearts, and help us serve one another by loving each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.